Members of the jury, I want to take this opportunity first uh, to thank each and every one of you for your service, your diligence, and your attention to this matter. We all recognize the disruption that jury service places on your personal and professional lives, especially in a case of this magnitude and duration. And so on behalf of Mr. Chauvin, I want to thank each and every one of you for your attention and service to this jury. I'm, I'm going to apologize if I get a little long-winded because I get one bite at the apple here. The state has an opportunity to rebut my statement after this. There's so very much we need to cover. There's so very much we need to talk about, and it is all important. Before I begin my review of the evidence in this case, I would like to address two very crucial points of law, and they were touched on by the state. The presumption of innocence and what proof beyond a reasonable doubt means. The presumption of innocence, the defendant is presumed innocent. That's the starting point. He's presumed innocent of these charges. And this presumption remains with him throughout the course of the trial, the presentation of the evidence, throughout the course of your deliberations, until and unless the state has proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant does not have to prove his innocence. We talked about this in jury selection. We talked about the starting point. The defendant doesn't have to try to catch up. He starts at the presumption of innocence. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Here's the definition that the judge just read you. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is such proof as ordinary prudent men and women would act upon in their most important affairs. A reasonable doubt is a doubt that is based upon reason and common sense. It does not mean a fanciful or capricious doubt, nor does it mean beyond all possibility of doubt. The law recognizes three standards of proof. The preponderance of the evidence is the first and lowest standard. Clear and convincing evidence is the next standard. And the third standard is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And the way we lawyers sometimes illustrate what these three standards mean is through the scales of justice. Right? The scales of justice equally balanced. When you apply the standard of the preponderance of the evidence, it's also called the scintilla of the evidence. A single grain of sand tips the scales in the favor of one party or the other. And this burden of proof is used in many civil cases. Somebody, if the state wants to take away your driver's license, for an example, that is the burden of proof that the state has in that type of a case. They have to just ever so slightly convince the finder of fact that their evidence supports their action. The next standard is clear and convincing evidence. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory, right? It is clear evidence, and it convinces you, the finder of fact, that the action is correct. This is the standard of proof that is used if the state wants to take away your children. Clear and convincing evidence. It tips the scales more in one, the favor of one party over the other. The highest standard in this country is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Essentially, what the state has to convince you is that there, the evidence in this case completely eliminates any reasonable doubt, or in other words, leaving only unreasonable doubt. Capricious, fanciful. Capricious doubt, capricious means unpredictable. 
fanciful. Space aliens flew in, inhabited the body of Derek Chauvin, and caused this death. That's fanciful. Beyond the reasonable doubt, it is the highest standard in the law. Doesn't mean beyond all possibility of doubt, because I suppose space aliens may have been inhabiting his body, but that's obviously fanciful and capricious. So this, these two standards, the presumption of innocence and proof beyond a reasonable doubt, work in concert with each other. You start with the proposition that Mr. Chauvin is innocent of these charges. The state has to advance substantial evidence to convince you that the only doubts that are remaining are unreasonable doubts. As you analyze the evidence in this case, you would simply have to find that any defense that has been advanced is unreasonable. That's, I mean, that's what this standard is all about. I want to take this opportunity also to talk to you about the importance of reading the entire instruction. Because I've seen, you know, and lawyers, and, and I'm gonna do it too, right? We pick and choose those things that uh, help us make our case and help us argue our case. That's our job as lawyers, is to point out words and phrases within the instructions that, that make the difference in the case, and to take that evidence and present it to you in such a way that it supports our proposition. That's what we do. That's why you are instructed that if your memories of the evidence is different, that if your, the, the judge's law is what applies. But take the time to carefully read the entire instructions. Throughout the course of this trial, you've seen us do this, right? Little snippets, a second here, a second there, a screenshot here, a screenshot there. You need to review the entirety of the evidence in this case it, during the course of your deliberations as well. And I can tell you that some of the videos that we've seen, they're much longer than what was presented in court. There's additional information, and you're gonna see some of that as we go through this case today. So take the time and conduct an honest assessment of the facts of this case, compare it to the law as the judge instructs you and the entirety of the law. That's why the instructions tell you, consider the instructions as a whole. I've, I've told you that lawyers like to present evidence that favors them, right? But we have to be intellectually honest about the evidence. We have to present it in an honest and intellectually cohesive and coherent manner. And I have to address something that I think is important. And I think it is a prime example of what I am asking you and what is your obligation to do to look at the evidence in light of all of the other pieces of evidence, right? So you heard during the testimony of Dr. Fowler that one of the things that he considered is the possibility that carbon monoxide was present and could have contributed to an environment that created an oxygen deprivation. You've, you heard that testimony. In rebuttal to that testimony, the state brought Dr. Tobin back in and he told you, we can completely disregard that. We know as a fact, we know conclusively that Mr. Uh, Floyd did not have carbon monoxide because his oxygen was saturated to 98%. And you just heard the state say, just like I am right here, right? So it stands to reason. I could get up in front of you and I could argue to you 
We know this wasn't asphyxiation because George Floyd had a 98% oxygen level. How could he have been asphyxiated at the hospital with a 98% oxygen level? But that's not intellectually honest. It doesn't stack up against the rest of the evidence because of what we know, right? We heard the testimony of Seth Bravender and Derek Smith, the paramedics. We heard the testimony of Dr. Langenfeld. They came in and they said, they began resuscitative effort, efforts, they introduced oxygen, an oxygen supply. We, they're, they're manually breathing for him. They're reoxygenating his blood. So when you look at that piece of evidence, when you look at a piece of evidence like that, you have to compare it against all of the other evidence. Because you can't come in and say, George Floyd, on one hand, George Floyd died of asphyxiation, but he has a 98% oxygen level, right? His blood is oxygenated. Then it is, stands to reason the opposite is true as well. You can't come in and say, I can conclusively prove that Mr. Floyd didn't have carbon monoxide in his blood because he had this high oxygen saturation. You test one statement against the evidence of other people and you compare it. That is what you as jurors are obligated to do and what I am asking you to do. Compare the evidence against itself. Test it. Challenge it. Compare it to the law. Read the instructions in their entirety. Start from the point of the presumption of innocence and see how far the state can get. I submit to you that the state has failed to meet its burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Mr. Chauvin has been charged, as the state indicated, with these three charges, and the judge has instructed you. Count one is second degree murder while committing a felony. It's also called the felony murder rule in Minnesota. Kind of the textbook example is, I run into a liquor store, I pull a gun, I'm intending to rob the liquor store, my gun goes off, I shoot and kill the teller, I didn't intend to go in and murder that person, but my, the death of that teller occurred while I was committing a felony. That's the felony murder rule. He's been charged with murder in the third degree for, for performing an intentional act that is eminently dangerous. Right? You've seen the instructions, you've heard them. And manslaughter in the second degree. Again, the law has all of the words, it defines the words you need, and the instructions should be considered in their entirety. Whenever I meet with a client, I try to explain what the elements are, and this is the analogy that I use. I say that a criminal case is kind of like baking chocolate chip cookies. You have to have the necessary ingredients. You've got to have flour and sugar and butter and chocolate chips and whatever else goes into those chocolate chip cookies. If you have all of the ingredients, you can make chocolate chip cookies. But if you're missing any one single ingredient, you can't make chocolate chip cookies. It's a simple kind of analogy. But the criminal law works the same way. We say, the we call the ingredients the elements. The state has the burden of proving each and every element beyond a reasonable doubt. Not just some global proposition that they've proved their case beyond a reasonable doubt. They have to prove each of these elements beyond a reasonable doubt. And if you determine that they have done so, you convict. But if they are missing any one single element, any one single element, it is a not guilty verdict. And you saw the spreadsheet that the state put up, right? The elements are a little different in each of these cases. 
and some of these elements will take less of your consideration. You will have to look at the evidence and you will have to, for example, determine is Cup Foods in the city of Minneapolis, is Minneapolis in the county of Hennepin, is Hennepin County in the state of Minnesota. Did this happen on May 25th, 2020? Right? It's going to take less of your consideration, but nevertheless, you have to do that. You have to go through that process. Two of the elements that I want to focus on during the course of my discussion here today, two of these elements are common throughout, or two of these issues are common and apply to all three counts. And so I want to focus my remarks today on those two issues. The first, were Mr. Chauvin's actions an authorized use of force by a peace officer, right? Because in the instructions, it specifically tells you no crime is committed if it was an authorized use of force, period, end of discussion. The second is an element that is and does appear in all three counts, that is the cause of death. What caused Mr. Floyd's death? And we're going to talk about that second. So let's start with the concept of reasonable force. As the instructions read in their entirety, no crime is committed if a police officer's actions were justified by the police officer's use of reasonable force in the line of duty in effecting a lawful arrest or preventing an escape from custody. The kind and degree of force a police officer may lawfully use in executing his duties is limited by what a reasonable police officer in the same situation would believe to be necessary. Any use of force beyond that is not reasonable. To determine if the actions of the police officer were reasonable, you must look at those facts which a reasonable officer in the same situation would have known at the precise moment the officer acted with force. You must decide whether the officer's actions were objectively reasonable in light of the totality of the facts and circumstances confronting the officer and without regard to the officer's own subjective state of mind, intention, or motivations. The defendant is not guilty of a crime if he used force as authorized by law. And to prove guilt, the state must further prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant's use of force was not authorized by law. So, you remember from my opening statements and how I talked about reason and common sense, right? The reasonable police officer standard. I want to just briefly add one thing here, is the standard is not what should the officer have done in these circumstances. It's not what could the officer have done differently in these circumstances. The standard is, what were the facts that were known to this officer at the precise moment he used force, and considering all of the totality of circumstances and facts known to the officer, would a reasonable police officer, what would a reasonable police officer have done? You have heard from numerous experts, police use of force experts, the training department from the Minneapolis Police Department. You've heard from police officers, street police officers, Sergeant Edwards, Sergeant Pluger, right? So you've heard from these people and they have given you their opinions at various stages as to the reasonableness of the use of force. But one of the things that the state, or excuse me, one of the things that all of these police officers effectively agreed to is that when you look at the question of what would a reasonable police officer do, knowing the facts of the case, there are things that a police officer is entitled to take into consideration 
above and beyond the facts, right? Their training, the training that they receive, their, their experience as a police officer, the department's policies on the use of force. And all of these things kind of lead into the question of, most critically, what are the facts that were known to the police officer, the reasonable police officer, at the precise moment the force was used? So you can start at a very high level, right? What were the reasonable police officer's knowledge of the area be? Is this a high crime location? Is it a low crime area? Those are things, those are facts that a police officer would know. What are the specifics of the location of arrest, right? Am I going into a dense, densely populated urban environment? Or am I in a kind of a secluded backyard, right? Officer is calculating these pieces of information and assessing the risk, assessing the threats. Officers are entitled to kind of take into consideration things that you and I don't think about. Their tactical advantages, their tactical disadvantages. They can take into consideration the scene security keeping the scene secure and security of the scene, right? Those are two different concepts. So kind of, again, focusing back into what facts were known at the precise moment force is used, you can then take into consideration kind of this mid-range level of, of information. A reasonable officer wants to keep his fellow officers safe. A reasonable police officer takes into consideration the safety of civilians. The reasonable place, the police officer, reasonable police officer takes into account the safety of the person that they are arresting. They take into account what resources do I have based upon how close am I to a hospital? What's the expected time if I call EMS? Because a poli reasonable police officer at times they got to put the person in their squad car sometimes and take them because they're farther away. Calling for help, bringing help in would take longer than it would simply to take the person directly. And then you look at the direct knowledge that a reasonable police officer would have at the precise moment force was used. That includes information that they gather from dispatch, their direct observations of the scene, the subjects, and the current surroundings. They have to take into consideration whether they suspect the suspect was under the influence of a controlled substance. They can take into consideration, because again, this is a dynamic and ever-changing, just like life, things change. It's a dynamic situation, it's fluid. They take into account their experience with the subject at the beginning, the middle, the end. They try to, a reasonable police officer tries to predict or is at least cognizant and concerned about future behavior based upon past behavior. But the unpredictability of humans factors into the reasonable police officer's analysis too. Because sometimes people take, reasonable police officers, take someone into custody with no problem and suddenly they become a problem. It can change in an instant. A reasonable police officer will take into consideration his immediate surroundings. Are there bystanders? Are there civilians? A reasonable police officer will take into consideration who he is at the scene with. Are these veteran officers? Are they rookie officers? What do I know about my partners and my partner's abilities? So throughout the course of this trial, the state has focused your attention on nine minutes and 29 seconds. The proper analysis is to take those nine minutes and 29 seconds and put it into the context of the totality of the circumstances that a reasonable police officer would know. And the proper analysis starts with 
what did the officers or what would a reasonable officer know at the time of dispatch? Well, these are records that are kept. They've been introduced. You can look at them. This is exhibit 151. This is the computer aided dispatch report. You heard the testimony of Jan, uh, Jenna Scurry, the 911 dispatcher. This is information that they are passing out to the officers. You will see that the initial the initial information that a police officer has in his squad car looking at his computer or hearing over the radio was that on May 25th, 2020, at 20.02.13, so that's 8.02.13, a business, Cup Foods, who police officers have the obligation to respond to these calls, whether it be from a person or a business, but a citizen of the state of Minnesota Minneapolis runs a business and they called for assistance. And they told the officers, the reporting party, there is a male who provided a counterfeit bill to the business. He's six feet tall or higher. He's sitting on top of a blue Mercedes ML320 SUV. The license plates also appears this subject is under the influence. So the analysis of what a reasonable police officer would know in this circumstance is that A, a business is requesting its help. The suspect is still there. He's large and he's possibly under the influence of alcohol or something else. So the analysis begins at 8.02 and 13 seconds. You may recall the testimony of Jenna Scurry as well, and it's not reflected in this exhibit pretty well, but in the evidence, uh, exhibit number 10, you can hear the audio recording of the dispatch, Jenna Scurry to the officers. Jenna Scurry informed you that initially Officer Chauvin was assigned to this call on a Code 3 Priority 1 basis. It's code three, get their lights and sirens, get there fast, right? It's priority one because the suspect is still on scene. So per the Minneapolis Police Department policy, get there fast, the person is on scene, right? That's what she testified. And then very quickly after that, that occurred at 8.04 and 28 seconds. Then what you see is often, or what she told you was that the sector car, sector car 320, that's the car that patrols this part of the city, said, hey, we can take this call. And Officer Chauvin and Officer Tao were canceled from the call. Right? So they were canceled from the call. And sector car 320, Officers King and Lane took it. And that occurred at 8.05 and 11 seconds. When Officer King and Lane took it over, you can hear, again, you can go back and you can listen to that audio of that dispatch. And you can hear them talking to each other. Officers King and Lane arrive at the Cup Foods at 8.08 .08 and 20 seconds. So now we see police officers are responding. They're on scene at 8.08. Both Jenna Scurry and Peter Chang described that during the course of the interaction between the initial interaction between officers King and Lane and Mr. Floyd, through dispatch, they heard what sounded like the sounds of a struggle. Jenna Scurry described she's trained to listen. She heard these sounds of a, of a struggle and she aired out on her own, other officers need to respond, code three, to assist officers King and Lane, right? So a reasonable police officer 
He's going uh, emergent to a scene. He gets canceled from the scene. He's now being told that other officers need assistance and step it up, get there fast. So you can see again, based on the records, that at 8 2010-08, backed up 320 with 330, right? So now 330 is Officer Chauvin and Tao. They're backing up Officer King and Lane. And you can see Peter Chang respond at 8, 10, and 21 seconds. You hear 320 taking one out. So they're rem that means they're removing someone from the vehicle at 8.11.02. The scene is ultimately C4, code 4, all clear at 20.12.21. So literally, this demonstrates to you a couple of things. How quickly a situation can change from second to second, minute to minute. They went from get there fast, back off. Get there faster because someone needs help, it's clear. The situation is dynamic and it's fluid. They're provided with information that an officer needs assistance. They testified about the sound of a struggle, right? And if you recall, Sergeant Steiger specifically said, all of this information would be known to a reasonable police officer. And it goes into and factors into the reasonableness of the use of force. Ultimately, Officer Chauvin and Officer Tao arrive at Cup Foods. Let's pause this for one second here. Sorry. When we look at Officer, I just have to, to give you a little piece of information. When we look at Officer Chang's video, Officer Chang arrives first. You see the time is 11633Z Zulu. That's Greenwich Mean Time. Subtract 5 from 1 a.m., get you back to 8. So, Officers King, or excuse me, Officer Chauvin and Officer Lane pull up. 816. Go over there. You can give it her and I and try to get us right. Okay, just stay put, all right? I don't want anybody near his car. information gathering in terms of this assessment and reassessment of, the, again, the decision-making process of a police officer, right? Don't come over here where I am, Officer Chang says. Go over there. They need your help. Because what, what at that point, at that precise moment, they don't know what's happening over at the squad car. They don't know that officers uh, King and Lane struggled with Mr. Floyd getting him out of the car, that they sat him down, that they stood him up, that they walked over. They haven't seen any of this information and there's no evidence to suggest that they had. So that doesn't factor into the information. It's again, a reasonable police officer, what do they know? And they don't know that. But they're starting to get some indication, hey, go over there, right? Go over there. You can see right at about 8.17, and I apologize for the quality of the picture, Officer Chauvin is arriving and walking up to the squad car. So what a reasonable police officer, what would a reasonable police officer see in this instance? What a reasonable police officer would see could be defined, because again, a reasonable police officer has to be aware of his department policies, active aggression or active 
resistance. Let's call it active resistance. A response to police efforts to bring a person into custody or control for detainment or arrest, a subject engages in active resistance when engaging in physical actions or verbal behavior reflecting an intention to make it more difficult for officers to achieve actual physical control. So as Derek Chauvin walks up to this scene, he has all of the information from dispatch. He has all of the information from Officer Chang sending him over. He knows his department policy on the difference between active aggression, active resistance, passive resistance based on policy, training, etc. This is an officer's consideration of, again, the use of force. All of these things factor into it. So what does he see? He sees Officers King and Officers Lane struggling with Mr. Floyd attempting to put him into the car. He hears the words that Mr. Floyd is saying at that point. I'm claustrophobic, I'm a good guy, I'm a good man, I'm claustrophobic, I just had COVID, right? He's hearing this information, he's observing with his eyes, a reasonable police officer is observing this with his eyes and his ears and assessing what he sees pursuant to policy. And what he sees at a minimum is active resistance. Mr. Floyd's not just simply getting in the back seat of the car. So let's watch what does Officer Chauvin see when he walks up. This is from his body camera from 8.17 and 21 seconds to 8.18 and 15 seconds. Just shy of a minute. You can't win. I'm not trying to win. Go on, get in the car. Don't get in the car. Go get in the car. Get in the car. Get in the car. He know it. He know it too, Mr. Officer. Y'all hear me? Don't do me like that, man. Please. Okay, I'll talk to you, please. So you get out of the car. I am a doctor. I'm claustrophobic. I'm hearing you. Y'all working with me. Get out of the claustrophobic. Get in the car. Get in the car. Get in the car. Get in the car. By 8, 18, and 15 seconds, Officer Chauvin has not laid a finger on Mr. Floyd, but he's observing, and a reasonable police officer is doing this. He walks onto a scene, he sees active resistance occurring, potentially active aggression occurring. He has two other officers, he has not intervened. But again, based on the policies and the training that you have seen, what were his options available to him at that time? If a person is actively resisting in the center, distraction techniques, controlled takedowns, conscious neck restraints. Can you clear that? Right. These are options available to Mr. Chauvin at this point. He has, per his training, these techniques at his disposal. A reasonable police officer would be making these observations. He would observe the white foam around Mr. Floyd's mouth. He would consider the possibility that this person was under the, sus or was under the influence of something. Basically, using the information from dispatch, Making these observations, how is he analyzing this? How would a reasonable officer analyze this, and what would be known to a reasonable officer? A reasonable officer would look at the size of the person and assess 
that person's size in relation to his own size. Because it's a part of the risk threat analysis, right? That we've heard about so much. A reasonable officer would know that these are two rookies putting this off, putting this man in the car. In fact, as the evidence established, Mr. Chauvin trained one of the officers. So a reasonable officer may step back at this point to see if these two guys can get this under control. A reasonable officer will hear the words that the suspect is saying. I'm a good guy, I'm a good guy, I'm a good guy, I'm claustrophobic. And he's going to compare those words to the actions of the individual, right? Because this is part of the analysis. Because I can say, I'm going to cooperate with you, I'm going to do whatever I want. But if my behavior is inconsistent with what I am saying, a reasonable officer takes that into consideration. In fact, a reasonable officer who's aware of his department policies knows the de-escalation policy that is in place. And part of what a reasonable officer has to do is to consider whether a subject's lack of compliance is a deliberate attempt to resist or an inability to comply based on these factors. Medical conditions, mental impairment, developmental disability, physical language, language barrier, influence of drugs or alcohol, or behavioral crisis. So an officer, a reasonable officer, has to take the information and assess, is this suspect purposefully or intentionally, deliberately trying to thwart our efforts to take him into custody? Or are they experiencing one of these other uh, types of factors. But such consideration, when time and circumstances reasonably permit, shall then be balanced against the incident facts when deciding which tactical options are the most appropriate to resolve the situation safely. So again, reasonable officer, based on the totality of these circumstances, going to take all of this information in, all of these policies, all of these training ends, and a reasonable officer at that point would conclude that the amount of force that was being used by officers King and Lane was insufficient, was not enough use of force to overpower Mr. Floyd's resistance to getting into the car. He's seen it, he's heard it, he's familiar with the policies, and so at precisely 8, 18, and 15 seconds, Officer Chauvin goes hands-on. Officer King, Officer Lane, and Officer Chauvin struggled, fought, however you, whatever adjective you want to use. They struggled with Mr. Floyd from 8, 18 till 8, 19, and 12 seconds. About a minute, a little over a minute. It doesn't really seem that it's that long of a time, but again, the amount of physical exertion. Remember how Jody Steiger, Sergeant Jody Steiger, described this. When the apparent attempts to get him into custody were futile, I wrote his quote down, the futility of their efforts became apparent. They weren't able to get him into the car three Minneapolis police officers were not able to get Mr. Floyd into the car. They themselves are experiencing that, that surge of adrenaline. A reasonable police officer will be experiencing that surge of, adren of adrenaline. And again, balancing all of the evidence against each other, right? Let's look at three different angles of this struggle. This is Officer King's body camera. Get in the squad. I'm going down. I'm going down. I'm not going to leave you. Bro, you walked down a heart attack. I know what can't breathe. Get in the car. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. 
Oh, Take a seat. Please, man. Please, man. Please listen to me. Is he going to jail? Listen to me. Speak. Uh, He's under arrest right uh, now for forgery. I'll tell you. Okay. Tell me for what? what's going on. Forgery for what? Let's take him out. For what? Please, man. Hey. I can't fucking breathe. Hey, come on out. Look at you. Thank you. Thank you. Get him on the ground. Ah. Get him on the ground. Ah. On the ground. Ah, my ah. Ah. He's under arrest for forgery. Forgery for what? This is the, the video of the same time period from Officer Lane. I'm going down the ground. 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 I'm going down. 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 I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Please, man. I need this to me. Do you want to jail this to me? He's under arrest right now for forgery. Okay. Okay. So we know what's going on. For what? Let's take him out and just. For what? Am I? I can't fucking breathe. Hey, come on out. Look at you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, yeah, just on the ground. Look. On the ground. Ah, I appreciate ah. that. Officer Tao. Okay. I'm down the ground. 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 Ah. 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 I'm going down. I'm going down. I'm going down. I'm not going to run, man. Right, 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 right. right. I know I can't breathe. I can't breathe. You're talking to me. Ah, 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 a reasonable police officer understands the intensity of the struggle. You can see at points when Mr. Floyd's legs kick back, it actually almost knocks Officer Lane over. Right? It knocks off the body-worn camera and the badge of Officer Chauvin in this struggle. A reasonable police officer would understand this situation, that Mr. Floyd was over, able to overcome the efforts of three police officers while handcuffed with his legs and his body strength. A reasonable police officer standard can be seen in another way from the milestone camera. And this is what caught the attention of the 911 dispatcher, Jenna Scurry. She said she observed the struggle and the vehicle rocking back and forth, back and forth. Watch the vehicle. 
reasonable police officers will consider their training, right? And before we talk about the training again, there's something that I think is really important to understand, two things actually, at this moment. Not a single use of force expert that testified, not a single police officer who testified said that anything up until this point was unlawful or unreasonable. It was reasonable for these officers to put them into the, Mr. Floyd, into the squad car. It was reasonable, the efforts that they took to overcome his resistance were reasonable. Every single expert agrees that to this point, nothing is contrary to policy, training, defensive tactics, crisis intervention, all reasonable. It's at the point that Mr. Floyd is brought to the ground that there becomes dispute about the reasonableness of the use of force and what a reasonable officer would know. It was Seth Stoughton, the law professor, who said at the point Mr. Floyd came out of the car, putting him on the ground was unreasonable. So, was it reasonable for Officer Chauvin or a reasonable police officer to put Mr. Floyd on the ground in that instance? So a reasonable police officer is going to rely on his training and information, his evidence, what he knows, all of the information he's built up to this point. You heard Lieutenant Mercer testify about how about 15 years ago, the Minneapolis Police Department went to ground defense tactics, getting people on the ground to control them, control the head, control the body, different types of moves that, a per that the police use to create and eliminate space, escape versus control. Those are two different things. These are the tactics that have been employed by the Minneapolis Police Department for 15 years. Why? Because it's safer for the officers and it's safer for the suspects. It keeps people contained, controlled, and confined until they no longer are resisting. A reasonable police officer would also consider his department's policies including the use of non-deadly force policy. Force that does not have the reasonable likelihood of causing or creating a substantial risk of death or great bodily harm. This includes, but is not limited to, physically subduing, controlling, capturing, restraining, or physically managing a person. This is the policy, 5-302 of the Minneapolis Police Department, that non-deadly force can be used to physically manage a person. And again, every single person has agreed that the use of force up to this point is reasonable, lawful, and meets the reasonable officer standard. And so we get into the 9 minutes and 29 seconds at this point. The state has really focused on the 9 minutes and 29 seconds. 9 minutes, 29 seconds. 9 minutes, 29 seconds. It's not the proper analysis. Because the 9 minutes and 29 seconds ignores the previous 16 minutes and 59 seconds. It completely disregards it. It says, in that moment, at that point, Nothing else that happened before should be taken into consideration by a reasonable police officer. It tries to reframe the issue of what a reasonable police officer would do. A reasonable police officer would, in fact, take into consideration the previous 16 minutes and 59 seconds. Their experience with the subject the struggle that they had, the comparison of the words to actions. It all comes into play. Why? Because human behavior is unpredictable. Human behavior is unpredictable, and nobody knows it better than a police officer. Someone can be compliant one second and fighting the next. 
Someone can be fighting and then compliant. Nobody knows it better. But reasonable police officers continue to assess and reevaluate. This is the critical decision making po policy, right, or model. You gather information, you assess the threat versus the risk. Do we have an authority to act? What are our goals and actions? Review and assess. Start over. Because this is not a singular cycle. This is a cycle that humans, as humans, we literally make millions of decisions in a day, right? Do I go this way? Do I go that way? Do I go up? Do I go down? I mean, we are constantly doing this. This is just human behavior. But in the policing context, you have to gather the information, assess the risk, assess the threat. Do I have authority to act? What are my goals and actions? Review and assess. And it's constantly rotating. At the precise moment that Mr. Floyd was laid on the ground, a reasonable police officer would know about those previous 17 minutes. A reasonable police officer would know about the struggle. He would con a reasonable police officer would consider the suspect's reactions to the previous use of force. A reasonable police officer would continue this process of reassessment. And a reasonable police officer would consider whether to use an additional force to overcome the suspect's level of resistance, right? So nine minutes and 29 seconds. I appreciate that, I do. You got your arm. Jesus Thank you. Continuing to assess the risk and the threat. The first 29 seconds, 20 seconds, continued resistance is what a reasonable police officer would interpret that to be. Jesus Christ, the kicking. A reasonable police officer would con consider, should we elevate the use of force as we meet this threat? And that's precisely what these officers did. They discussed using the MRT, the hobble. Mama, I love you. I can't do nothing. Yeah, on the way. My face is gone. Well, do you want to hop on? Uh, 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 please, 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 let me stand. No, please, man, can't breathe. They're discussing. Should we use the hobble? Should we elevate our use of force? A reasonable officer would continue to evaluate whether the suspect is under the influence precisely what these officers did in nine minutes, in this nine minutes and 29 seconds. So reasonable police officers discuss the scene. The first clip, they're talking about the two other people that are over at the car, right? What's going on here? What are we dealing with? Is this person under the influence of a controlled substance? These are the actions of a reasonable police officer. A reasonable police officer would rely on his training and experience. Call EMS. Possibility 
that a suspect who was struggling with us will begin to struggle again. You've heard this testimony from multiple police officers. The risk that the suspect would present to himself if he's not continued to be controlled and the risk that the suspect presents to other officers or citizens if not continued to be controlled, if he's not continued to be controlled, right? These are things that all of the police officers have testified about. These are what a reasonable police officer should do. A reasonable police officer in this situation would call EMS. 2020, 11, 8, 2011. Within a minute of the struggle, EMS code two for a mouth injury, right? Because they are not observing life-threatening, a reasonable officer is not observing life-threatening injuries at this point. They just fought with the man for a minute. He continued to kick at them when they got him on the ground. They see he's got a mouth injury, we need EMS. So a reasonable police officer would evaluate the injuries of the suspect, compare words and actions, and respond by calling EMS, non-emergency. But again, reasonable police officers evaluate, reevaluate. 2021, 821, one minute and 24 seconds later, we need EMS here faster. Code three. 3.30, we need him here faster. A reasonable police officer would take into consideration the anticipated time of a emergent response. You heard from Genevieve Hansen, there's a firehouse a few blocks away, and she would have expected EMS to be there within minutes, three minutes, is what she said. A reasonable police officer based on his training and experience is going to have and take that into consideration. I put this person in a prone position on the ground. I'm holding them for my safety and their safety. I'm expecting someone to be here within three minutes to help this person. I have called for that help. A reasonable police officer will take into consideration, again, his training, his experience, right? Lieutenant Mercil talked about, and, and many people talked about, many of the officers talked about how it is not uncommon for suspects to feign or pretend to have a medical emergency to avoid being arrested. Unfortunately, that is the reality. Nobody likes to get arrested, and reasonable police officers know that. How many times does someone, pre oh, my heart hurts, or I'm having a medical emergency, insert whatever emergency, right? Simply because they don't want to go to jail. A reasonable police officer will take his training into, ex into experience. And you heard Lieutenant Mercil specifically say, that when someone says that they can't breathe but they are talking, if they're talking, it means they're breathing, right? If they're talking, it means they're breathing. And again, compare that to the testimony of Dr. Tobin, who told you that same thing. That is true. If you are talking, you are breathing. It doesn't mean effectively. And Dr. Tobin described how even medical doctors have problems sometimes assessing the, the legitimacy of a patient's needs relevant to their respiratory processes because they're saying, I can't breathe, and some doctors confuse it for just anxiety or this or that. So if medical doctors make these mistakes, Dr. Tobin told you it provides a false sense of security, right? Lieutenant Mercil told you that that is what is said among police officers. He's the trainer. So how many times do we hear an officer say, based on his training and experience, if you can breathe, you can talk. If you can talk, you can breathe. Excuse me. I counted seven. Me, man. Me. Oh, oh, you can't do anything. I can't choke. 
I can't breathe, no, Bobby. Please. You're talking. Ah. Sit down. Ah. Ah. Fine. Ah. Bobby. I know I can't breathe. I can't breathe. You're talking to me. Ah. 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 Oxygen. Ah. 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 I'm sick. Reasonable police officers, again, are trained and take into consideration a person's actions relevant to their words, their training, their experience. Takes a lot of oxygen to talk. Takes a lot of oxygen. You're breathing fine if you can talk. I can't breathe. Uh, uh, he's talking, he's talking uh, so he's fine. Uh, okay. Uh, we tried that for 10 minutes. That's a bum-ass shit, bro. That's a bum-ass shit. Y'all know that. Okay. He's talking, he's fine. Bro, he ain't. Okay, we're done. You sir? Okay, we're done. Reasonable police officers will take into consideration their training and experience on excited delirium, and they will analyze it within the context of this case. I just worry about the excited delirium or whatever. I worry about the excited or delirium or whatever. That's why we have EMS coming. It's not just leave them here, it's we have EMS coming, and this is why we have EMS coming. Reasonable police officers throughout the course of a control technique will continue to assess the level of resistance. Remember what Sergeant, excuse me, Lieutenant Johnny Mercil said. Simply because a person isn't kicking at you or punching at you or biting at you, it does not mean that you can't control them physically with your body weight. This is at 824. <laughs> This is the point where Dr. Tobin testified that Mr. Floyd had an anoxic seizure, right? But it's not, we're not analyzing the use of force from the perspective of a doctor with 46 years of medical experience who had 150 hours of time to watch an event from multiple perspectives over and over and over and over again. It's a reasonable police officer standard. How would a reasonable police officer interpret this? Does a reasonable police officer even know what an anoxic seizure is? A reasonable police officer will interpret this as at least some form of minimal resistance. Reasonable police officers, again, are continuing to monitor. They're expecting EMS to arrive. Language is crazy. 
Non-deadly force is included, it includes, but it is not limited to physically subduing, controlling, capturing, restraining, or physically managing a person. These are the policies of the Minneapolis Police Department. Reasonable police officers, again, continue to monitor. See if he's breathing. Yeah, I think he's passed out. Yeah, I mean, my knee might be a little scratched, but I'll survive. I think he's passing out, but he's breathing, right? This anoxic seizure occurs. Reasonable police officers are building and basing their decisions based on all of these factors coming in at multiple times, including the bystanders. Right? Call them a crowd, call them onlookers, call them bystanders. It doesn't matter what term you use for the people that gather to watch what police do. Reasonable police officers are cognizant of and aware of their surroundings. And before I really kind of start talking about the crowd in uh, some de limited detail, I have thought a lot during the course of this trial about the difference between perspective and perception. Perspective and perception are two distinct concepts. Perspective is the angle at which you see something. It's your perspective. Perception is how you interpret what it is that you see. I've thought about this a lot during the course of this trial because this uh, situation here in the courtroom is incredibly unique, right? It's not the normal setup for a jury trial. So my perspective through the course of this trial, sitting in this chair, is that I cannot see four of the jurors. Very limited opportunity to observe the jurors. They probably can't see me either. Several of the jurors I have a very good view of. Four of the jurors I don't, and obstructed views of others. My perspective sitting in this chair when witnesses, there is a camera blocking the head. So in order for me to see the witness, I have to roll all the way over to the other side. Then I have to look through the plexiglass that has these large reflecting lights. Right? Things block your perspective. Things can affect your perspective. But your perception is how you interpret what it is you see and what it is you experience. And that is our life, right? This is our experiences. These are the things that make us who we are. Three people in this trial went to the same high school. Me, Darnella Frazier, and Chief Arredondo. We all went to the same high school, obviously at different times. My experience, Chief Arredondo's experience, Darnella Frazier's experience, all based on, went to the, we had the same perspective, sat in the same classrooms, saw the same chalkboards or whiteboards, the same perspective, but our perception of our experiences there is gonna be much different. Ultimately, at the end of the case, when we're done with these arguments, the court will instruct you on how to deal with these biases and the perception issues. The court's final instructions will guide you to try to recognize your biases, recognize them, what we bring to the table, and analyze the evidence from the perspective of the evidence itself. So let's look at this incident on May 25th from the perspectives and perceptions of simply just four of the bystanders. Right? Charles McMillan, 61 years old, third grade in education, grew up in the South. He described himself as a curious guy. He likes to know what's going on in his neighborhood. So he stops and he checks things out, right? 
his perspective, he's the first one who's dealing with these guys. He has more information because he sees the entirety of the situation. But his perception of the event is affected by his life's experiences. At the end of the night, ultimately what he said to Officer Chauvin was, I hope you get home safely, because that's what he says to police officers every night. Can you advise the fire department if they're still with you? They need to go to 36 Park to assist with the police department. That's one person's opinion. But you know what? I got to get him. I got to get him. We got to control this guy because he's a sizable guy. Yeah, and I thought, I thought like, he didn't get in the car. Looks like he's coming on something. But I'm just saying, you know, I'm violent. But no, I got nothing bad to say about it. Because you, you respect me, I'm going to keep respecting you. Right. You have a good night. You go home safe with your family. Don't keep you safe. Darnella Frazier. She's a 17 year old high school student who, upon seeing the restraint of George Floyd, her response was to pull out the cell phone and start recording, and then subsequently upload it to Facebook, right? Her perception of the event and her perspective of the event. She's looking, she didn't even know that officers Lane and King were there because her perspective was blocked by the squad car. But her perception, her response to the situation was to record it, and that's perfectly fine. But she began her recording at 8, 20, and 51 seconds. Donald Williams. He's a 33-year-old professional mixed martial artist who arrived at 8, 22, and 39. He had spent the day fishing with his son, stopping for a drink when he became aware of the incident. He described his view of this based upon his perception as a mixed martial artist. Right? He has a set of experiences that caused him to react in a different way. What he perceived was happening was that Mr. Floyd was being choked with a blood choke. I think we're past this at this point. The, the pa paramedic reached in, touched the carotid artery. To have a person rendered unconscious through a choke requires the, the blockage of both carotid arteries this was not a neck restraint. This was not a chokehold. He was upset. And that, again, is okay because his perception affected what he was seeing. Genevieve Hansen, right? 27 year old female firefighter for the city of Minneapolis. She testified that when she walked into the scene, she described the crowd as upset. She said, I walked into an upset crowd. She said that the other voices distracted me from getting the officer's attention. And she testified, again, based on her perspective, that Officer Chauvin appeared to have his hand in his pocket. She observed what she believed to be blood on the uh, from Mr. Floyd's face being pressed into the pavement. She observed fluid coming from Mr. Floyd's body that she presumed to be urine. She testified that nobody ever told her that EMS or an ambulance was on the way. She asked about, when I asked her about the response time she would have expected, three minutes. When I told her that paramedics had been called about five minutes prior to her arriving on scene. No way, because her perception is three minutes. But when you look at the things that Miss Hansen saw, whether it be from her perspective or her perception, there can always be more to the story. The blood coming from Mr. Floyd's nose was why they called EMS in the first place. You've seen the pictures. He injured his nose during the struggle, or his face during the struggle in the squad car. The fluid that she described as potentially being urine, we know that that's fluid coming from the underside carriage of the squad car. Yeah. 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 
Officer Chauvin specifically told her an ambulance was coming when she first came on scene. Oh, come over here. Oh, come over here. Oh, we need you. Yeah, we need you. We need you to keep some distance. Yep, we got an ambulance coming. The computer aided dispatch reports clearly show what time EMS was called. So Genevieve Hansen has a perspective and a perception. And what she observed was not consistent with the actual evidence. But remember, we don't look at this incident from the perspective of a bystander. We do not look at this incident from the perspective of the people who were upset by it. We look at it from the perspective of a reasonable police officer. A reasonable police officer, when confronted with these bystanders, would know everything that had occurred up to that point. 20 minutes, 25 minutes, 30 minutes. They know all of that information. The bystanders do not. A reasonable police officer would understand that his actions were actually being recorded. Take the bystanders out of it. Officers wear cameras for a very specific reason, to record their actions, so they know they're being recorded. Officers are aware of the placement of city cameras. You're in a high retail, you've got gas stations, restaurants, uh, convenience store, high surveillance. Right? Reasonable police officers know this. They would know if citizens take out their cell phones and start filming. This is the point at 8.20 and 49 seconds when Ms. Frazier starts recording. Reasonable police officers are aware when they're using force that sometimes what they are doing does not look good to the general public. A reasonable police officer will hear the frustration growing. Right? A reasonable police officer will hear the increase in the volume of the voices. A reasonable police officer will hear the name calling, right? Chomp, whatever, whatever names are being called. They'll hear the cursing. They're, they're, it does, they'll hear this, and they'll take that into their consideration. A reasonable police officer will rely on his recent training. A reasonable police officer will hear what an, I'll come back to the training. A reasonable police officer will hear what the crowd is, is saying. He will compare his actions to what they are saying. And he will determine, I know I'm being recorded, right? I know I'm being recorded. They're saying that I'm doing something that's awful looking. Am I going, am I doing this? Right. Oh. He is human, bro. Oh. He's getting old. Put him in the car. We tried that for ten minutes. That's a bum ass shit, bro. That's a bum ass shit, bro. Y'all know that. Some guy sit there with your knee on his neck, bro. He's talking. Bro, he ain't crying, bro. You you circle it like in a jujitsu move, bro. You try you trapped in his breathing right there, bro. Like you don't think that what it is, bro? You don't think nobody understands that shit right there, bro? I trained at the academy, bro. That's some bullshit, bro. Right? That's bullshit, bro. That's bullshit, bro. You, you fucking stopping his breathing right there, bro. Okay, he's talking. He's talking, bro. But you can get him off the ground. You've been a bum right now. You can get him off the ground, bro. You can get him off the ground. You've been a bum right now. He enjoying that. He enjoying that shit. He enjoying that shit. He a fucking bum, bro. He enjoying that shit right now, bro. You could have fucking put him in the car he by now, bro. He's not now. resisting the rest or nothing. You, now? you can see Officer Chauvin's body language tells us a lot, right? That's what we just heard. Looking down, looking up, looking around, looking down, looking over, looking around. He's comparing. A reasonable police officer is doing what a reasonable police officer would do. He's comparing his actions, his own actions, in response to what the crowd is saying. A reasonable police officer, again, will rely on his training. 2020, 
March of 2020, Tactics of a Crowd. Never underestimate a crowd's potential. Most crowds are compliant. Crowds are very dynamic creatures and can change rapidly. A crowd may contain elements of several types of groups. Now I acknowledge that this is in dealing with massive crowds, protests and things of that nature. These are the tactics, but you never underestimate a crowd's potential because a reasonable police officer has to be aware and alert to his surroundings. A reasonable police officer will consider his department's policies on crisis. And what is defined as a crisis? Crisis, an event or situation where an individual's safety and health are threatened by behavioral challenges to include mental illness, developmental disabilities, substance abuse, or overwhelming stressors. A crisis can involve an individual's perception or experience of an event or situation as an intolerable difficulty that exceeds the individual's current resources and coping mechanisms and may include unusual stress in his or her life that renders him or her unable to function as he or she normally would. The crisis may not necessarily, may, but may not necessarily result in an upward trajectory or intensity culminating, culminating in thoughts or acts that are possibly dangerous to himself, herself, or others, right? A reasonable police officer is recognizing that the crowd is in crisis. That all of these things, the members, the bystanders, the citizens, whatever you want to call them, they are in crisis. So a reasonable police officer considers his department's training. What are these potential signs of aggression that I may be confronted with? Somebody standing tall, somebody red in their face, raised voice, heavy breathing, tense muscles, pacing, right? This is from the crisis intervention training. This is what Kerr Yang testified to. These are signs that police officers are trained to look for in a crisis as potential signs of aggression. How do you respond to those? You appear confident in your actions. You stay calm. You maintain space. You speak slowly and softly, and you avoid staring and eye contact. Again, these are things that Kerr Yang discussed in terms of how to deal with a crisis. As this crowd grew more and more upset or deeper into crisis, a very critical thing happens at a very precise moment. And I cannot, in my opinion, understate the importance of this moment, the critical moment in this case. If you recall from Dr. Tobin's testimony, nobody disagreed, that Mr. Floyd took his last breath at 8.25.16. 8.25.16. What is happening at the very precise moment that Mr. Floyd takes his last breath? You're taking one piece of evidence and you're comparing it against the rest. This moment, 825-16, as Mr. Floyd is taking his last breath. Get off of him now. What the fuck? He got maze. He got maze. He cannot breathe. Come here. No, first of all. Look, you can check on him. He's not responding right now. Look at him. Three things happen. Mr. Floyd takes his last breath. You see Officer Chauvin's reaction to the crowd is to pull his mace and shake it. He's threatening the use of force as is permitted by the Minneapolis Police Department policy. And Genevieve Hansen walks in at that time from behind him, startling him. All of these facts and circumstances simultaneously occur at a critical moment. 
And that changed Officer Chauvin's perception of what was happening. After this point, the crowd grows louder and louder, right? And at this point now, Mr. Floyd has taken his last breath, and the question is the rendering of medical aid. When do we stop CPR, according to the Minneapolis Police Department's policy? When it's not safe. You heard Lieutenant Mercer talk about this, and you also heard um, Nicole McKenzie talk about this. Consider Nicole McKenzie's testimony. As far as the reasonable police officer, which would include Nicole McKenzie, she discussed at length the difficulty of performing CPR in what she would describe as, or she did describe as, a hostile environment. You miss science. You agonal breathing can be confused for effective breathing. As she testified, people in the area can affect the decision to treat a subject at the scene. She described how it is incredibly difficult to perform EMS efforts in a loud crowd, difficult to focus when you don't feel safe, makes it more difficult to assess a patient, makes it more likely that you can miss signs that a patient is experiencing something. So the distraction, she said, can actually do harm to a patient. When we're talking about this critical decision-making model, right? As Lieutenant Mercer said, he testified, sometimes you have to take into consideration whether it is worth the risk to remove the handcuffs and render medical aid because it's unpredictable, right? All of this information is coming at a reasonable officer. The reasonable police officer standard can also be extended to Officer Chang, right? What is his perception of the crowd? You heard him testify, but you can also look at what his body, what was he doing during, his, during this time? got Officer Chang pacing, turning around 360 degrees, right? His attention is focused on what's happening with the crowd. But he also has another job, right? Reasonable police officers and how they interact with the crowd is a consideration. You can also take into consideration the reactions of Shawanda Hill and Maurice Hall. police officer and their reactions to what's happening, but also consider the paramedics, right? The paramedics, they did the load and go, right? As Derek Smith testified, he got out of the ambulance, he checked all four corners to gauge what was happening and determined in his words that it was an unwelcoming environment and he told his partner they needed to move to a different location, a more safe and secure location. 
Remember Nicole McKenzie's testimony too. As unreasonable as it sounds, paramedics get attacked too. We have all of these different opinions in terms of the use of force, right? We have all of the opinions of Seth Stoughton, Jody Steiger, Barry Broad, Zimmerman, Arredondo, David Pluger, Lieutenant Mercil, and they all reach very different conclusions about when the force became unreasonable. All you have to know about Barry Broad is what he was talking about is this physically managing any person. His opinion was you can use non-deadly force to physically manage a person. It's all within the model of the MPD decision-making model. I found the most interesting person to be relevant to the use of force, Lieutenant Johnny Mercer. Considering that he is Derek Chauvin's actual use of force trainer. So the best glimpse that we're going to get into the training of a Minneapolis police officer comes from the trainer who conducts the trainings. He's conducted hundreds of trainings over the years. He corrected the st state at certain times in terms of how strike charts don't apply to restraint techniques. He said the knee on the neck is not an unauthorized move, and it can be utilized in certain circumstances. He described using a knee on the neck and back and stated that it can be there for an extended period of time, depending on the level of resistance you get. He said that once a suspect is handcuffed, it does not necessarily mean that it is time to move your leg, because when people are handcuffed, they can thrash around and continue to be dangerous to themselves and others. He talked about the ground defense program because it's safer for both the suspect and the officer. He talked about ground defense as a form of using your weight to control a subject without, and, and therefore replacing the need to punch or strike them. He said there's no strict techniques. You need to be fluid and adapt to the circumstances. That he personally trains officers to put a knee over the shoulder, up to the base, base of the, deck, the neck, and he described this maneuver as routinely trained by the Minneapolis Police Department. He testified that there are circumstances that an officer would need to use his weight to continue to control a subject. He recognized the concept of awful but lawful, right? Sometimes the use of force is just not that attractive. He's experienced himself arresting people who have claimed to have a medical emergency. He explained how peop, one way people can resist is through their words. He described how someone resisting can become passive and then become resistant again, and vice versa. He discussed how officers are trained not just to focus on the subject, but also the bystanders. He trains officers that if you're fighting with a suspect and that person then becomes compliant, it is a legitimate consideration for the continued use of force to control a subject that if a subject overpowers more than one officer at a time, that is a legitimate consideration in the continuation of the use of force. He talked about substance abuse and how that officers are trained, right? I understand that superhuman strength is not a, a real phenomenon. I know there are no supermen or spidermen, right? But officers are specifically trained that someone under the influence of certain types of, of controlled substances exhibit this behavior. They become stronger than they normally would. We've all heard the anecdotal stories of the pregnant mom lifting the car off of, a, of a someone, right? It's not literally describing a superhero. It's simply describing that someone is more exhibiting a greater strength. And the Minneapolis Police Department specifically trains that. He trains on neck restraints. Minneapolis Police Department has a specific written policy on the use of neck restraints, and it was permitted, even though this wasn't a neck restraint or a chokehold. He talked about how you need to cut off the blood supply for this, for a neck restraint, to both sides of the neck. He talked about how someone whose heart rate is beating faster 
They go unconscious quicker, less than 10 seconds. He described the human factors of force. That is, how does the use of force affect the officer himself, his cognition, his abilities, his mental and physical uh, state. He agreed that not using the MRT is a form of de-escalation. He described that sometimes you have to use your body weight to control a subject until the scene is code four. He said that Minneapolis will train officers that under certain circumstances, an officer can hold a person in the prone position until the scene is safe. And he's done it himself at times. You have to take into consideration the presence of bystanders, where officers are located, and the environment that they're in. Lieutenant Mercil agreed that there are circumstances where you, as I talked about this a little earlier ago, where you have to make a decision, is it work the risk to take the handcuffs off to perform medical aid? He said there are circumstances where you wouldn't put someone in a recovery position. Depending upon the, sa the safety of people, including the crowd, while awaiting EMS, he described how crowds can make situations chaotic. He said simply because a person is not actively resisting, that does not mean that you cannot use force. Right? Doesn't mean that you cannot use force. Simply because someone isn't stabbing you or punching you or shooting at you, it doesn't mean that you can't use force. And that is specifically in the Minneapolis Police Department policy on the non-deadly use of force that we've looked at a couple of times. The use of force is an incredibly difficult analysis. You can't limit it to nine minutes and 29 seconds. It started 17 minutes before that nine minutes and 29 seconds. All of this information has to be taken. You have to look at it from the totality of the circumstances. You have to look at it from the reasonable police officer standard. You have to take into account that Officers are human beings capable of making mistakes in highly stressful situations. In this case, the totality of the circumstances that were known to a reasonable police officer in the precise moment the force was used demonstrates that this was an authorized use of force as unattractive as it may be. And this is reasonable doubt. Steiger talked about being on the panel, right? They have five officers on a panel to assess whether uses of force are reasonable. Sometimes it's four to one, sometimes it's three to two, sometimes it's five to zero, because the reasonableness of the use of force is not an easy easy thing to consider. I'm, I know, again, I'm, and I'm sorry, I'm long-winded. There are a couple of other things I need to talk about very briefly. I promise I'll be as brief as I can before I get to the cause of death. First is that concept of intent. As the state showed you, with respect, respect to counts one and two, you have to address Mr. Chauvin's intent. Pay careful attention again to the instructions. Words have meaning. Intentionally or intentional means that the defendant either has the purpose to do the thing or cause the result specified or believes that the act, if successful, will cause the result. In addition, the defendant must have knowledge of those facts that are necessary to make his conduct criminal and that are set forth after the word intentionally, intentional. It's the same, same you'll see a very similar uh, instruction. You'll see this very similar instruction twice. Intent. Did Officer Chauvin intentionally apply unlawful force? That's what you're being asked to decide. 
did he purposefully, purposefully apply unlawful force to another person? In count two, you have to decide, did he purposely perform an act? Did he intentionally perform an act that was eminently dangerous? Right? What considerations do you have to, at your disposal? What pieces of evidence do you have? I'm going to try to go through these quickly. What evidence is there? What evidence is inconsistent with intent? Some facts and circumstances that are important for you to decide in terms of his intent is within the context of aiding and abetting other people. First, officers know that they are being videotaped. They know they're being videotaped by themselves. They know they're being videotaped by bystanders. They know they're being surveilled by the Minneapolis Police Department milestone camera, right? They know these things. Do you do something purposefully that you know is an unlawful use of force when you have four body-worn cameras immediately in the area where you have multiple civilians videotaping you, where you know your actions are being reviewed through a city-owned camera where there are surveillance cameras? Do people do things intentionally and purposefully when they know they're being watched? Remember, Officer Lane offered to have, when they were putting Mr. Floyd into the squad car, he said, I'll sit with you. I'll put the window down. I'll turn on the air conditioner. Please. I'm just that's the phobic. That's me. Oh, she's still going in the car. <laughs> Anything sharp on you? I won't do nothing to hurt you. Without you anything no, me. sir. Not even like a comb or nothing? Nothing. Why are y'all doing me like that? Mr. Officer, please pack it for me and stuff, man. Yeah, okay. I am claustrophobic for real, Mr. Officer. You got him? Could you please pack it for me, please? Yes, I'm packing. I will. Me, man. I will. Please stay with me, man. Thank you. <laughs> down three times. I'll turn on the air conditioning. Is that evidence of intent to apply unlawful force? Officer Chauvin confirms that Mr. Floyd is under arrest. Take a seat. Leave, man. Leave this to me. Is he going to jail? Let me speak. Uh, He's under arrest right uh, now for forgery. Okay. Okay. Tell me for what? what's going on. Forgery for what? Let's take him out. For what? Please, man. Officer Chauvin made a decision not to use higher levels of force when he would have been authorized to do that, including punches, kicks, elbows, right? All of these tools were available to Officer Chauvin. That is not an intent to purposefully use unlawful force. They call for EMS within one minute of putting him on the ground. They step it up within another minute and a half. He believes that his, Officer Chauvin believes that Mr. Floyd's ability to speak means he can breathe and they say it repeatedly, remember? Oh. Oh. Excuse me. They tell him to relax. Oh. 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 All right, all right. Oh my God. So how you go to jail? Officer Chauvin is never swearing at him. He's not calling him names. All of this stuff that we've already talked about, and I don't, I don't need to go through this again. All of this stuff that we've talked about, 
throughout the entirety of this circumstance does not reflect an intent to purposefully, intentionally commit an unlawful use of force. All of the evidence shows that Mr. Chauvin thought he was following his training. He was, in fact, following his training. He was following Minneapolis Police Department policies. He was trained this way. It all demonstrates a lack of intent. There is absolutely no evidence that Officer Chauvin intentionally, purposefully applied un unlawful force. <laughs> officer Chauvin is also refocusing the other officers, telling them they need to do things to pay attention to Mr. Floyd. <laughs> Should I put his stuff in the car? No, we need to get him in the ambulance. Let's refocus, all right? Officer Chauvin had no intent to purposefully use, or he did not purposefully use unlawful force. It's, it's, these are officers doing their job in a highly stressful situation. According to their training, according to the policies of the Minneapolis Police Department, and it is, it's, it's tragic. It's tragic. They go to the hospital. They perform CPR. They call their supervisors. Was this an eminently dangerous act? Was putting Mr. Floyd an eminently dangerous act? We've heard a lot about the prone position. Consider just the basic prone position. People sleep in the prone position. People suntan in the prone position. People get massages in the prone position. The prone position in and of itself is not an inherently dangerous act. It is not an inherently dangerous act. A prone position during restraint is not an inherently dangerous act. It is routinely trained and used by the Minneapolis Police Department. The studies show, right, the Canadian studies that were referenced by Dr. Fowler, 1,269 cases, use of force, one death of a person not in the prone possession. Right? These are people, they're looking at people in the prone position. 4,828 consecutive force events. No significant clinical effects on the subject's physiology. Right? We can look at all of the other studies. Trying to determine this question is, is putting a subject in the prone position, even with officers on top, even with weight on top of the person, is that inherently dangerous? And the research says no. The practical experience says yeah, that says no. The prone position, when applied through a use of force, is not an eminently dangerous act because there is no evidence to support the notion that it was highly likely, that's the standard, highly likely to cause death. There's reasonable doubt about that. 